I suppose we said we have tsunamis versus uh, mega tsunamis. Most of them are relatively infrequent. We only have a significant tsunami uh, about once a decade or so in the Pacific. Um, the Pacific is the, the story for most of the tsunamis in the world where the action is happening and uh, the most destructive, the most deadly tsunami that we've had uh, in our uh, species history is the 2004 Indonesian um, tsunami that killed uh, almost 230,000 people. So what are tsunamis? Tsunamis are powerful, destructive, very long length waves who um, uh, have their destruction when they shoal, when the water level gets um, uh, shallow, when they near land. As they come to land, the wave height or, or the, the height of the wave itself gets very tall or can get very tall. Um, again, the specifics are going to depend on the local um, topography. The cause most typically as is an earthquake oftentimes a vertical displacement. Most of the earthquakes that are causative of tsunamis are going to be relatively shallow, so meaning within 50 kilometers of the bottom of the ocean. And that's an, most typically an undersea quake, but it can be right, right next to the um, ocean. It could be uh, underneath the continental plate potentially. Um, and we generally need something that's a magnitude of about 6.5 or greater. Um, the greater it is, the more likely it will generate a tsunami. Um, and that, that strong movement is needed to displace the seafloor to in turn displace the water column. And the, the stronger the displacement, the more likely we'll get a tsunami, the larger the area over which that earthquake acts. Uh, the more likely we are to get a tsunami. And if we start getting up a, a large area on the order of hundred thousands, hundreds of thousands of square kilometers, um, then we're getting into prime uh, tsunami generating territory there. Uh, the initial wave length needs to be about three times greater than the water is deep to get the the physics right to generate the tsunami. In the open ocean, these things can go really fast on the order of 500 to 1,000 kilometers an hour. Um, in the open ocean though, they're relatively small. So the displacement of the, of the surface, if we're on a boat, we'd only see the water go up as this wave goes past us about a third of a meter or so, third to half of a meter. The wavelength, though, extremely long. They can be as long as 650 kilometers, which is crazy. Um, then the run-up, which means when the um, uh, tsunami gets to the, the coast, um, while they can be taller, you know, something like 30 meters is a, is a fairly, 10 to 30 meters is, is a fairly common number for uh, some of these larger tsunamis. And how far they go inland is going to, uh, again, depend on the local topography, but they can easily go kilometers inland if the conditions are right, um, with some going as far inland as about 10 kilometers. So if we look at an, uh, a wave here, um, what typically happens is we don't get a huge amount of, of displacement once we get below about half the wavelength uh, in terms of depth of the water. Uh, and so this is, this is the typical story, right? So we have the wave is moving from the left side of your screen to the right side of the screen. Uh, the water, mole the, the, the water um, molecules are basically going up and down in sort of a circular motion, and that energy is propagating to the right. And, um, and so, this, so this, this is the open ocean. As we get into uh, something uh, like an, next to an island or next to a continent, as the water uh, shoals, as the water gets um, uh, shallower, then essentially the, the water um, gets friction, gets resistance from the bottom of the ocean and, and the water closer to the top moves faster than the stuff below. And then we start to see the classic wave breaks and, and things of that nature. So that's for typical waves, what we might call wind generated waves. 
Uh, so let's contrast those with tsunami waves. So wind generated waves are going to move anywhere from a few kilometers to a maximum of something like 100 kilometers per hour if we have a huge amount of fetch, if we have a huge amount of area over which say a storm uh, can act upon, uh, consistently act upon the surface versus a tsunami is going to be, you know, an order of magnitude uh, or or multiple orders of magnitude faster than a wind driven wave. The period of the wave, a uh, wind driven wave is, a, is a, a few seconds typically. A tsunami wave is on the order of tens of minutes to hours long. The length of the wave is going to be uh, of a wind driven wave, again, on the order of 100 to 200 meters. Um, a tsunami wave is going to be many hundreds of kilometers long. Uh, and again, the wind wave is going to be more of the slosh it up, slosh it down, maybe maybe um, a little bit higher than just the tidal action if we have you know, a really windy day kind of thing, pushing the water a little bit more inland. But it's still going to break and then wash back and then boom, go on land and then wash back out to sea. Whereas the tsunami is going to um, be a wall of water. Now, it's not necessarily the very first wave that will be a huge wall of water, but the idea is when it does come in, it's a, it's a large chunk that goes in and stays in for um, an extended period, much more so than the typical um, up down of our regular tidal or wind waves. So here's the, the story of a tsunami, and then I have an animation to show you in a, in a second. But basically, we can talk about a couple different uh, uh, phases, a few different phases. And so um, so I have the, the, the phase on the left, and I have a, an illustration uh, from the USGS on the right. And um, I just want to say that this is not, this is for illustrative purposes here. So the height of the water, the blue here, is not um, it's not necessarily exactly uh, to scale. So this is to just make sure you're getting the point. So the first of the generation, again, the classic generation is going to be an earthquake. Some kind of big displacement, uh, you know, boom. And so we can either get, uh, you know, the, the, the bottom of the ocean moving up or the bottom of the ocean moving down or both. You know, it's going to depend on the, the actual type of quake. But, but regardless, we can get um, the, the spark of the displacement of the water mass. And again, we need that, we need the wavelength to be um, at least three times uh, the depth of the water or greater. Uh, and then we can, we'll tend to see a split, right? So we'll see water is gonna propagate out in all directions. And so one part is gonna move landward towards the shore. The other part is going to go the opposite direction. So it's going to go across the, the basin or the bay or whatever it is. Um, and so we get these, these sort of, uh, you know, bifurcation, if you will, of the wave energy. Uh, then, and so it's going to, and so this open ocean, let's say, and now, now if, if the earthquake happens right next to our um, coastline and we're on that coastline, we're going to experience the local tsunami almost depending on how it happens, almost simultaneously with the earthquake. Um, but then the, the um, transoceanic propagation or the, the transbasin propagation, that's going to take a while. So as it's going across, again, that's the one that's very long, but is a, is a relatively um, little height on the surface of the ocean. So again, if we're on a boat, the boat might go up for a little bit, but we're probably not going to notice it. The amplification is going to take place when the waters begin to shoal as we get close to land. And so as we get close to land, that water is going to start piling up, piling up, piling up, and the height is going to get bigger and bigger. And then we have the run up. And so this is where it's going to come ashore. So two different components there. There's both the how high, how, how far above mean sea level, up, up into the sky the wave goes, and then how far inland it's going to extend. And it's going to as we saw from those videos, it's going to come in like sort of like a tide, kind of like a tide, but then it just doesn't go out and just keeps coming and coming and coming and coming. And, uh, and after that very first uh, chunk of water comes in, uh, then we oftentimes will get a train of waves. And uh, in those second uh, 
additional waves that are going to come in, we oftentimes will get this drawback or this recession of the water, the, the, the going down of the sea level. And so we might get fish stranded out in the reefs and, and, and areas that are underwater normally are all of a sudden laid, uh, laid bare and, and, and in the air. Uh, and then it's going to come in and, and, and swoop in very fast. So we have generation, uh, the split of the wave, part going towards the nearest land, the other part going to across the basin. Uh, it amplifies when it comes into shore, and then we have this run-up phenomenon. So let's take a look at what that looks like here. This is a nice little animation from our friends down under and that I think is is of all the videos I've seen this is this is I think the the cleanest nicest it's just a just a couple minutes here um, so we're going to talk about the initiation with the undersea quake the displacement and so uh, in this particular exa example they're saying that it's it's five kilometers deep we have a subduction plate here going on and then we have the earthquake and so we have the wave beginning to propagate towards the nearest uh, landmass and away from the nearest landmass. And as we mentioned before, this is moving somewhere between 500 and 1,000 kilometers per hour. And this is roughly um, the speed of a modern uh, a 767 uh, type of aircraft. Open ocean, very small um, wave height. And at some point, the animation will continue. Okay, there we go. Uh, and then we're get, now we're coming close into land. So now the, we're beginning to pile up, pile up, and now it's going to slow down. The speed is going to slow down a bit, and the water is going to pile up and flop on top of itself and then start to, to go inland. And now we're approaching the beach or, or the, uh, the city. And so the water first comes in and boom. Okay, so this first wave front is just a big, you know, big tidal wave, a big boom going in. So everybody's wet and things are damaged, etc. The next uh, phase is where we get the drawdown or the drawback or the recession. And so water's sucking out to sea, the reefs are exposed, and this is where people walk out and like, oh, wow, this is weird. Let's check this out. And then unfortunately, this is how uh, folks die because uh, they now have this, they're now they now completely drowned by this very, very fast moving water that shoves them inland, drowns them, and, and, and shoves all manner of stuff far inland. And this cycle will essentially repeat as, these, as this wave energy bounces around um, the, the basin or the bay or the um, region in question. Okay, there we go. Okay, okay, so, so we've talked about this, but basically this is just another um, uh, illustration cartoon of, of how the tsunamis uh, occur, but we've already seen all this. Um, so the drawback can be quite dramatic. Um, in the case of the 2004 um, uh, earthquake, you could, it could draw back the, again if it's a relatively shallow, relatively um, uh, you know low relief uh, coastline. Uh, you can get it going. The recession can happen for you know hundreds of meters and uh, lead to all kinds of problems. So when we talk about the propagation. This is some modeling effort of the 2004 um, tsunami. You see it going and. And this is all after the facts. This is not measured in real life. These are mathematical recreations of how we think the waves propagated around. And so oftentimes we're, we're in this immediate area. We're looking at the area uh, close to the um, epicenter itself. Or, 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 or yeah, yeah, I'll say that. But we can also look at um, larger scale patterns. And so this is that same phenomenon, but now we're looking at the scale of the whole global ocean. And so we're seeing these wave heights propagate around and have a look at this, right? This is not like a wave. You're seeing the wave go, it's bouncing, it's refracting, it's bouncing backwards, it's, it's bending, it's wrapping around things like the southern tip of Africa, and then we're gonna see it in a second wrap around the southern tip of South America. 
And this wave energy, uh, the height, right? So the red is the, the, the higher areas. These lumps of water are essentially spreading around the globe. And check it out. Now we're about 30 hours after the event. Still propagating. Still, still water moving around the Earth. So these events are very long-lived and very large scales. Have occur over a very large scale. Um, and in turn, we can see extensive damage. So here is uh, one of the areas impacted um, by the 2004 tsunami. This was before the tsunami. This is a picture from 2003. This is a picture after the tsunami, three days after the tsunami struck. Um, so essentially, everything's devegetated. There's no green plants. Um, we see very few uh, intact human structures, etc. Same thing here. Uh, we see um, lots of d destruction. We can see uh, overturned ships. We've seen lost roads and, and, and transportation networks, contaminated sewers, contaminated water sources, etc. Uh, massively destroyed slash removed uh, infrastructure of all kind. And we often can detect a high water mark indicating where um, scour and damage has occurred uh, which will mark the highest point of the tsunami in that particular area. Um, again, same phenomenon, all kinds of homes, etc. Before, afterwards, everything is pretty much gone. Um, as far as, as, you know, looking at, or, or as far as our, our quantitative understanding of tsunamis, this is one of the oldest, I think this is the oldest quantitative record measurement, uh, a concurrent measurement of a tsunami as it's happening. This is a tide gauge in San Francisco Bay. This is, um, what was this? I think this is in Sausalito, I think. And this is, um, uh, uh, this is showing the tides going up and down. So a tide gauge, the daily going up and down because we wanted that for uh, commerce and navigation as folks were coming in to anchor with their goods, et cetera, trade in San Francisco Bay. And the tsunami is overlaying on this existing uh, tidal gauge. So we can look at this. This is, the, this is 1854. And um, we see, uh, th this is from a paper where folks were, were modeling, oh, I should, I did not put the authors in here. That's my bad. I will have to uh, do that. Um, but basically, you, we can read these tide gauges and look at, if we have quantitative records, we can read the overlay of the tsunami action on top of it. And that's the basis for our modern tsunami monitoring network. Um, that last record was uh, a, pen, a pencil on paper. But uh, currently, we do this with much more sophisticated tools. The state of the art right now is NOAA's uh, deep ocean assessment and reporting of tsunamis. And so there's a network, uh, we'll watch a video in a second. I believe it's something on the order of uh, currently about 29 buoys uh, in, in, in monitoring sensors uh, and about another 20 or so from other collaborating countries. And so we have this system that is going to uh, be very accurately measuring uh, changes in water pressure. And therefore, the stack of water above us communicate that to satellites and then relay that in real time to an early warning center so we can um, better understand and measure um, these waves as they come across ocean basins. Uh, this is what one of the current, uh, I think we're on generation four now, if I'm remembering correctly, of the DART um, uh, sensors uh, deployed across the world. And so these are increasingly sophisticated and, and powerful and very sensitive detectors that we have going on here. So this is a short video. It's only a couple minutes, but this, this will go over um, uh, the monitoring network. Uh, essentially as it stands out. It was a couple years ago, but this, this basically will tell us a story. This is from NOAA. December 26, 2004. What began as an undersea earthquake in the Indian Ocean 
ended as the most deadly tsunami in recorded history, with nearly 240,000 lives lost. This was a devastating wake-up call to coastal communities and tsunami research. Prior to this event, only six of NOAA's Deep Ocean Assessment and Reporting of Tsunami, or DART, buoys were in place. Scientists could only predict tsunami arrival times, not flood potential. And there was not a global tsunami warning system. Today, 10 years later, we can tell a different story. U.S. and international coastlines are far better prepared for such a catastrophe, thanks in large part to research and technology developed at the NOAA Center for Tsunami Research at Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory. NOAA's DART array is now complete, with 39 buoys operated by the National Weather Service's National Data Buoy Center. Along with 21 international buoys, this array can measure a tsunami wave as small as one centimeter in the open ocean and provide these data in real time to forecast when a tsunami may hit the coast and how much flooding there will be. NOAA scientists and engineers are currently testing the fourth generation DART buoy that will be able to measure local tsunamis as well as distant ones. Flooding forecast models incorporate local topography and historical tsunami data in order to more accurately predict exactly how a tsunami might behave when it reaches shore. NOAA has 75 site-specific models that can provide high-resolution flooding forecasts for effective response and mitigation during a tsunami event. NOAA has gathered data from every tsunami since 2004 to improve its forecast models. Today, it operates the world's only real-time tsunami flooding forecast system using DART data to accurately compute flooding forecasts. The NOAA Tsunami Warning Centers make tsunami data available on the internet and issue advisories, watches, and warnings through the emergency alert system and via NOAA weather radios. While it is impossible to prevent a tsunami, we are now much better prepared to detect them and predict their paths and impacts so those in coastal communities can take the steps necessary to safely protect themselves. Okay, so just wrapping up here <clears throat> as far as what these, uh, what, what the tsunami stuff means to us here in uh, Ventura County, um, we are not as uh, potentially problematic as some of the areas around Humboldt and, and parts of Northern California that are more directly facing um, Alaska and Japan, these areas that generate so many of our, of our cross-basin tsunamis, but nevertheless, we are still absolutely um, potentially in the path of future tsunamis and we will experience tsunamis uh, guaranteed. Um, now we have detailed maps of tsunami hazards across the state of California. You can look this up on our um, state websites. But locally here, um, and I've sorry, this is we're looking at the Ventura County coast here um, on the right. And I've zoomed into one of the maps that so as we look here, uh, mostly we have you know this very the Rincon Coast and things very much up and down, um, uh, uh, Santa Monica Mountains very much certain you know, up and down uh, coast, not a whole lot of plain. But where we have these flat areas, these broad coastal plains, that's where we can get more problematic um, flooding because the 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 um, tsunami waves, even a moderately high tsunami wave, can go in fairly far. And so these are our tsunami hazard zones. And so the area for us around <clears throat> uh, sort of the Oxnard, Port Wyneme area, um, uh, this whole region um, is, is potentially directly vulnerable to a tsunami. And so you will see when you go around these areas, actually anywhere in California, you'll see the tsunami um, evacuation signs uh, instructing people to, uh, you know, to, to where to go uh, if there is a tsunami warning or, or where to evacuate to uh, if there is a tsunami warning. So we have a pretty good feel for the risks in our state and compared to other parts of the state where we're not particularly vulnerable. But again, living on the coast, anybody on the coast anywhere is potentially exposed to tsunami. 
So just to wrap up uh, real quickly, um, tsunamis, we get big ones about once a decade in the Pacific Basin. We have to have the right conditions. We have to have this very strong pulse, very strong shaking, which translates to a very uh, a quick, rapid, display, large-scale displacement of the water column. Uh, mostly that's through earthquakes. The next most common would be through landslides, either below the surface of the ocean or uh, just next to a bay or embayment. Um, uh, again, most of the vast majority of our tsunamis are caused by undersea quakes. Um, the most impactful tsunamis known are those that have occurred in our own lifetimes. So the 2004 Indonesian tsunami and the 2011 uh, J Japanese tsunami, which we'll talk about um, when we talk about uh, nuclear hazards. Um, and if you do experience tsunamis, if you do hear about a tsunami, don't do what I did when I was a silly grad student. Don't run to the coast. Go the opposite direction. You want to go inland and upward. And we do have a, a pretty sophisticated network that really was, was massively overhauled and, and experienced a huge injection of funding. Uh, an international collaboration in the wake of that massively deadly, massively destructive 2004 tsunami. And so the current early warning network is pretty darn sophisticated, can always be better. We can always have more resources. We can always have more accurate accuracy. But again, um, we now have the ability to, to much more accurately predict the timing, the arrival of tsunamis in different areas around the world. And the, the, the size and, and inward inland reach of those tsunamis when they would reach the area. So much better for uh, managers and people to give accurate warnings to folks. So that's tsunamis, a common coastal hazard that we have to deal with uh, all around the world. Thanks, you guys.